So today, Matt Johnson from Cal Poly Humboldt will be presenting first. And then afterwards, we'll have Brianna Martinico from UC Davis. And then we'll go into a little um, discussion where we can cover some more of your questions or maybe get into some farm specific details. And then we'll wrap it up with a conclusion and a post survey poll. So uh, we still have a little bit of time here, um, but I think Matt, if you wanna get ready to, to start, I'll stop sharing my screen. All right, thanks, Brian. I'll share my screen now. No. You guys seeing it? Okay, great. Um, well, boy, it's really my privilege to be here today. Um, thanks for uh, the introduction and thanks for the invite to, to be here um, to Brian and Shelly and Joanne and everybody at Wild Farm Alliance. And thanks everybody for attending. Um, this is really exciting. Um, and I'm really excited to also uh, be working with my co-presenter, Brianna. Um, she'll be talking in a few more minutes. Um, we, we both have experience working with rodent eating birds um, in agricultural settings. So we're going to talk about um, some practicalities of that idea um, from a couple of different angles today. And, and my portion of the talk is going to focus on um, nest boxes for a variety of species, but especially for the barn owl that you see here. And then Brianna will talk about some other strategies, um, including using uh, perches. So as I said, really exciting um, opportunity to be here um, and really thankful to talk about this topic because this is, I think, a really powerful one um, for farmers and for birds. Um, I think this can be a win-win situation. So um, there's a number of key questions I think that I'd like to sh um, shed some light on. And the first is, how can the raptors be attracted? And there's a variety of ways to track raptors as well as any other birds and, and other wildlife to your farms. And as Brian mentioned, there'll be other presentations in the future about habitat effects, hedgerows, as well as the farmscape, as well as the broader landscape and how natural and semi-natural and uncultivated habitats can help attract wildlife to your farms. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on that today, although it is relevant even to the use of nest boxes, but instead Brianna and I are gonna focus on nest boxes and perches as a really practical tool you can use to attract raptors to your farm. And so one of the things I wanna emphasize here is that this is real. This isn't just like a feel good thing, like you, know, you can attract these awesome animals to your farm. These animals we believe can really help you control rodents. So you can see that little video there. This is a video taken by my graduate student, Jamie Carlino. That's a nestling barn owl choking down an enormous gopher. <laughs> and so there really has, uh, in the last um, just really 10, 10 years or so, there's been this increasing amount of research documenting that this uh, has real ability to help contribute to integrated pest management of rodents in agriculture. And so I've uh, put up on the slide here a few studies. A lot of these studies have been done in Europe, and they're all pointing to Europe as well as Israel, all pointing to the idea that attracting rodent, or attracting raptors to your farms with nest boxes can help contribute to pest management. But let's focus in a little bit more on how that works um, in the United States and, and in California, where um, a lot of the research has been happening over the last uh, five to seven years. So one of the reasons barn owls in particular can be so powerful um, for helping to control rodents is that they pretty much only eat pests. So these are data from Sarah Cross um, showing that the barn owl diet consists of like 99 plus percent rodent pests. And that's a, in real contrast to other types of natural enemies, um, you know, birds or even predatory spiders they will eat pests too, but rarely is that predator only eating pests. And barn owls have that attribute where virtually everything they eat is a pest. 
Um, in California, that's, most, that's mostly voles, gophers, mice, um, and to a lesser extent, rats. But they'll eat whatever the common rodent species is in your area. So if you're in Florida, they might be eating cotton rats. If you're in Malaysia, they might be eating different kinds of rats. Um, and so all over the world, researchers have found that barn owls will eat the locally common rodents. Um, and in many cases, those are pest species. What they're eating does seem to be affected by the landscape around it. And so you can see in these two pictures, the text beneath these two pictures suggests um, that in, when they're feeding, especially in row crops, they're eating a few more mice and voles. And when they're eating in orchards and vineyards, they're eating a few more gophers. So it may be influenced by the crop as well as the surrounding landscape. But another key question is understanding where these animals hunt. So a team of graduate students and I have been trying to answer these questions, especially in Napa Valley vineyards. And we've trying to, we're trying to systematically ask questions, ultimately leading to a better understanding of how and if and how these barn owls can be meaningful agents of pest control. So if they're gonna really help pest control, we need to know where they're hunting. You can put up a nest box and you can attract a barn owl but if they then just fly over the crop and hunt in the adjacent fields, that might help a little, but it's more helpful if they're um, feeding in the crop itself. So we put some GPS trackers on birds. This was done by um, my former graduate student named Geronimo Castaneda, and we could see where the birds were hunting. And so here's a picture of that. Um, the, this, this circle is essentially the hunting range of a barn owl, which is up to about a mile and a half or a little longer, even farther in some cases, but they spend a lot of their time close to the nest box. In fact, about 50% of the hunting occurs within 500 meters of the nest box. Um, and you can see they're using lots of different habitats, different colors here. But when we tabulated all of these data for all, lots of birds tagged, we found that they're spending between 30 and 40% of their time hunting in the vineyard in this Napa vineyard ecosystem. And so we think that that result probably extends to other agricultural systems as well. They're not just commuting over the farms and feeding in adjacent habitat, they're feeding in the farms themselves. Uh, and as I said earlier, um, usually that is within 500 yards of the nest box. So that was work done by Hieronimo, as well as a former graduate student, student named Allison Heisman. Okay, so that's good. You can attract them to your box and they are going to hunt nearby, including on your farm. So the next question is, how many rodents do they kill? To answer that question, a former student named Dane St. George put surveillance cameras inside boxes. And so from that, he could see, like you just saw that adult coming back with a rodent, he could tabulate how many times the adults were coming back with rodents to feed their chicks. And when we did all our calculations, we estimated that over the course of a whole year, a barn owl family, both adults and three to four young, will kill somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 rodents every year. And so if you're getting these barn owl families nesting in boxes on your farm, that's an enormous number of rodents that can be removed. So that's very encouraging. But of course, there's a lot of rodents out there. So are they killing enough to really matter? Um, this is a very recent work um, completed by a graduate student named Ashley Hansen, um, and she used um, a method to examine gopher activity on vineyards without nest boxes, as well as on vineyards with nest boxes. And she did that work at two times of the year, in February, when the, they're just starting to lay eggs, um, and so there might be an adult or two around, but no chicks, and then again later in May, and there should be both adults as well as a, a, a whole brood of chicks um, that the adults are trying to feed as quickly as they can. And what she found was on the vineyard without nest boxes, gopher activity increased 18% over this time period. And on the vineyard with nest boxes, gopher activity declined 14% over that same time period. So this is some of the best evidence we have so far um, in the United States that indeed you're not, you're not just attracting these animals to your farm. They're not just hunting in the farm. They're actually reducing the activity of rodents um, in the farm. So that's a really encouraging finding. 
So let's get to some of the practicalities then and how you might apply this technique on your farm. Where should you put your nest boxes? Well, we've been monitoring 300 boxes um, in Napa for um, a number of years and we've expanded some of that work to other uh, farms and other places. And we monitor the boxes by just putting a GoPro on the end of an extendable pole so we can non-invasively see which boxes are occupied and which ones aren't. Um, and this is work initially started by Carrie Wendt, um, who's in the top right there, and continued by my current group of students, Laura E. Chavez, Sam Chavez, and Jamie Carlino um, in the lower right. And what we've found um, are these uh, recommendations. The occupancy is highest for nest boxes that are at least three meters or about 10 feet off the ground. Um, occupancy is highest for boxes that aren't too short, so they should be about 24 inches tall or more. Um, they, the, the birds seem to prefer wooden over plastic boxes. And then a couple of other things are really clear. That is that the probability of occupancy is higher when there are some uncultivated habitats nearby, especially more open habitats like grasslands and oak savanna. Um, depending on where you are in the country, um, barn owls uh, prefer um, more open habitats. And in fact, they're less likely to occupy nest boxes if there's a lot of dense forest nearby, as well as if there's a lot of urban habitat nearby. So the surrounding uh, semi-natural habitats really matter. And this little figure on the left kind of illustrates that. These are two boxes um, and a circle around the box at about um, two and a half kilometers or so. Um, the box on top is in the center. Um, the gray dot is the center. All this sort of orange color is grassland. That box was occupied. This box down below, um, the box there is in the center. All that purple color is vineyard. That box was unoccupied. That's just an example of two boxes, but when we statistically look over that, over many boxes, we see these tendencies. Oops. Okay, so on to some of the more practical recommendations um, about the boxes themselves. So nest boxes, there's lots of different designs out there. And in my experience, whoever makes or sells a box is often convinced that their box is the best box there is. <laughs> But what we're trying to do is to do some systematic studies to really help inform what seems to be best um, for barn owls. Um, and we'll continue to revise that as we learn more. But this is what we know um, so far. Um, to prevent predators, the boxes should be installed on a pole, ideally a metal pole. Um, it's best if there are some um, grooves um, on, the, uh, on the box so the owls can get better grip um, on the box. Um, and with the appropriately sized um, opening, not too big so that um, ravens or hawks or some other predator might be able to get in. Um, and then of course, big enough to enable the owls to get in. We'll show you links to some designs here in a moment. Um, and then it's also helpful to have this partition. So this partial wall in this little diagram here, here's the nest box entrance. The owl would go in here and then nest um, in this sort of chamber. Um, but then this partition wall will keep um, a hawk's um, talon or, or a raccoon's arm from being able to reach around and grab uh, the chicks. Um, it's also good for nestling safety to have the hole closer to the top of the box so they don't accidentally um, uh, fall out or climb out prematurely before they're ready to fledge. Um, it's also clear that larger boxes are preferred by owls and larger boxes allow them to have more room, mitigate heat stress, probably exercise their wings more and so on. Um, in terms of uh, managing heat, having the opening facing north or east, if you're in the northern hemisphere, will um, keep it from getting that hot afternoon sun. Um, and then holes drilled for ventilation um, can be really important. And then in the hottest areas, you might consider adding um, extra panels above and to the sides or back um, of the box as, as heat panels. I'll show you a diagram of that in a minute. So um, there's lots of different ways you can go about um, getting your nest box. You could build it yourself. Um, and so here are a couple of links. Um, the Barn Owl Trust has a large box um, as well as the Humane Wildlife Control has a large box design. And then working with Brianna and other colleagues, we've put together recently um, a design that we think pulls from some of the um, strong attributes of several other designs. Um, you could also buy them. 
Um, and then here's three vendors that make boxes that we think um, fit some of the recommendations uh, we're offering today. Um, here's kind of a, a 3D rendering of the box um, and the design that uh, Brianna and I and colleagues have worked on. Um, so it has a lot of the attributes I just talked about, including um, a depiction of these heat shields or heat panels. Um, in terms of nest box placement, um, late summer, fall installation is best. The birds begin to court in the winter and then can begin uh, laying eggs in early spring. So getting them up in late summer, fall is best. You can have them close together. These birds are not especially territorial. So put up one or a few and if they get occupied, add more. Um, it's best with open habitat nearby. As I said, the barn owls avoid dense forests. Keep them away from busy roads and houses. Um, busy roads are a source of mortality for barn owls. And colonization can take a little while, maybe one to three years. If it hasn't been occupied in three years, then consider moving it somewhere. Um, and you can always look for bones or, or portions of pellets that the birds regurgitate underneath the box as evidence that it's being occupied. It is important to clean and maintain the boxes. Um, so there's a commitment of time and money. Um, they should be inspected during the non-breeding season, again, in that late summer, fall. Fixed if they're falling apart. Pull out old pellets and debris that are there. Um, and also put in wood chips or some kind of straw in there. And that goes for the same when you first put up the box. Um, put some nesting material in there to cushion the eggs. Um, and then don't disturb the boxes that have owls during the breeding season. Um, if you're here in California, um, in the North Coast, um, both Napa and Sonoma have programs um, that will service your boxes. And so you can make use of that opportunity. Um, and in just in the last uh, couple of minutes here, I'm going to um, comment on American kestrels. And you'll hear a little bit more about kestrels as, other, and as well as other birds in a, in a subsequent uh, presentation. But since they can also be important um, predators for rodents as well as um, some birds, I wanted to mention them. And they will also nest um, in nest boxes. So they prey on mice, voles, insects, birds, and reptiles, so a broad range of taxa. Less is known about their pest control capabilities, um, but they certainly can um, influence their prey, both in terms of the numbers of prey as well as the behavior of some of the species that they're hunting. So the American Kestrel Partnership is a good resource for information um, about kestrels. And again, these slides will be available to you in the recording. Um, and uh, there are good designs for kestrel boxes, nest boxes as well. They're a smaller box, Again, you wanna install them on a pole eight to 12 feet up um, and put some shavings inside them, um, but they can be a effective way to attract um, kestrels. Kestrels also use open agricultural habitats um, and they will hunt uh, near the nest box, just like a barn owl will. Um, they are more territorial and secretive than barn owls. So they should be installed a little bit farther apart and they're in general, a little harder to attract um, to nest boxes than barn owls are, but in certain contexts, they can be um, a really important addition. And, and in, across much of the United States, at least American kestrel populations are declining. So putting up nest boxes can be a good way to help the species. Um, kestrel boxes can also be um, occasionally used by other species, including some beneficial species like Western screech owls, um, Northern flickers and other native songbirds, uh, but they could also be used by some pest species, including European starlings. Um, so it would be good to monitor your boxes at the end of the breeding season to see um, who's using them and consider moving them if you're just uh, providing boxes that are essentially providing host, ho homes um, for these pest starling species. Um, and I think I'll just conclude with um, the comment that um, I'm really excited about this topic because I think it has a real practical application for farmers. But I'd, rem I'd be remiss to not mention that um, there's other reasons for doing this, right? Um, barn owls and, and all wildlife are amazing creatures and we have this opportunity to share this planet with them. Um, and by putting up a barn owl box and attracting a barn owl family to your farm, you have the opportunity to be in the vicinity of these amazing creatures. So I think there's real value in, in a reciprocal relationship between farmers and barn owls. Farmers can attract, can build these homes or buy these homes and attract um, barn owls to their, to their farms. And then barn owls are gonna do what barn owls do and that is hunt rodent prey. And they might be providing a pest control service um, on your farm. 
So I'll close there just by recognizing um, a lot of our uh, funders and collaborators. Um, and I think there's a little bit of time for questions. Awesome, thank you, Matt. Yes, so we have time for some questions here. And this is also gonna be a, a moment where you will have a, a poll that says Matt quiz. But remember, these aren't graded, these aren't shared. Um, so if you can work on those, uh, we'll spit through a few of these questions. How's that sound, Matt? Yeah. Great, so we have first question related to chicken flocks and just curious if these owls will cause harm to chickens potentially if you're a chicken farmer. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, no, not as much problem as, as hawks uh, and other raptors might, but um, I think for the safety of your chickens in general, you should have them uh, you know, in a place where they're covered at night, right? So if they're running around during the day, the barn owls are gonna be sound asleep. They're not gonna be bothering your chickens at all. Um, and at night, um, you're probably going to want to bring the chickens in for multiple reasons. <laughs> right. <laughs> Great. Um, and then there was a, a clarifying question when you referred to too short as 24 inches plus. Was that referring to the placement height or the height mm. of the box itself? Yeah, great question. So yeah, we um, box height, by that we mean the height of the box itself. So we think that that should be 24 inches or more. Um, and then pole height, meaning how high the box is above the ground, should be 10 feet or more. Great, thank you. And kind of like we talked about before starting today's lesson, Matt, uh, somebody was curious about those plastic boxes. Do the birds really use them? They do use the plastic boxes. Um, I mean, we have evidence that they prefer the wooden boxes over the plastic boxes, but we also have lots of plastic boxes that are used. So I would say, you know, if you're considering building or buying boxes, go for the wooden. But if you already have plastic boxes up, and especially if they're being used, then keep them up. Um, they're not ecological traps for the bird. The birds will occupy them and be able to be successful in them. Um, and if you have plastic boxes that are not being occupied, you might consider replacing them with wooden ones, or the cheaper route would first be to move that plastic box somewhere else to see if it gets occupied. And then if it doesn't, replace it with a wooden one. Wonderful, thank you. So we're gonna wrap up this uh, poll here shortly. So if you can fill that out if you haven't already, we'll get Brianna waiting in the wings um, and all those questions that we didn't quite get to now, we'll have another opportunity to get to them later. Or if Matt, if you wanted to jump into the chat, you can do that as well. So really quickly, Matt, did you wanna um, just kind of confirm what those correct answers were for your poll? Oh, um, yeah, let's see, can I see the so, question? Yeah, first one was just how many rodents does that family oh, yeah. actually consume in a year? Uh, yeah, 3,000 to 4,000, so people did well. Um, let's see, question two, what types of habitat um, nearby? Grassland and oak savanna um, seem to be the open habitats that are especially helpful. Um, question three, how far off the ground? At least 10 feet, and that was it, right? Yeah, everybody looks like they did pretty well. So amazing job. So thank you, Matt. If you wanna go ahead and stop the share on your screen and Brianna, we're ready for you when you are. All right, just let me share my presentation. All right, can everyone see and hear, um, see my slides and hear me okay? Okay, great. So um, I'm gonna be talking about attracting other types of raptors to agricultural areas. And as we can see here, um, there's a variety of raptor species that consume pests on farms um, in, from vertebrate pests like birds and rodents and even insect pests as well. And um, by targeting these pests, they're providing this natural pest control service. And so um, we'll be talking about attracting these species with raptor perches. And in the Western United States, you know, we're really lucky to have a very diverse raptor community. Um, although I do want to point out that the species that are present are going to vary by the region and also the time of year. So if you or the habitat surrounding your property. Um, so if you have a lot of forests or um, woodlands around your property, you might see more Cooper's hawks. 
Um, another example is here in the Central Valley where I am. I see a, this huge influx of migratory red-tailed hawks in the winter, but then in the summer, um, I see a lot more Swainson's hawks. So it's always kind of, there's always gonna be um, fluctuations, but in general, we have um, a great variety of species. And I wanna point out that raptors are kind of include a, a bunch of different groups. So we have hawks, owls, falcons, eagles, and harriers and kites. Sorry about that. And, um, but um, overall, the majority of their diets are consist of small rodents that are pests on farms. And so some of the large, some of the smaller species like kestrels and screech owls may um, target more of those smaller um, insects or birds and with like eagles and other larger hawks focusing on things like ground squirrels or rabbits. But um, overall, there is a lot of pest species that um, have the potential to be consumed by these raptors. Um, okay, so what do we know about how they can help with rodent pest problems? And um, so like I said, they do have overlapping diets with barn owls and they can, because they are out more during the day, they can target those key diurnal pests that barn owls might not um, influence as much, um, especially California ground squirrels. Um, but overall, there's just less research available on how uh, raptors will impact pest populations and damage, crop damage on um, farms. And so a couple key um, research projects have been very promising though. Um, in Southern California, it was shown that raptor perches and barn owl boxes install, installed along a levee um, system were actually more effective than, sorry, my light. <laughs> um, were actually more effective than using um, anticoagulant rodenticides to control uh, burrowing rodents. Um, they're also known to readily hunt in and around um, crop, crop fields and that their presence can reduce prey activity and um, prey density. But um, the benefits, and I think Matt touched on this for a second, the benefits aren't limited to what they are directly consuming because they also, having predators present creates um, a, what we like to call a landscape of fear where pest species have to spend more time being vigilant and protecting themselves from um, predators in the area. And, and in turn, they spend less time foraging or maybe causing damage or um, just having more activity um, that's reduced by having predator, predator presence in general. Um, all right, so jumping right into some of the benefits of raptor perches, um, a variety of nocturnal and diurnal, so um, like owls and also all of the other hawks, eagles, falcons, um, will use perches to hunt from. Um, they so different raptor species have different hunting techniques where um, some will hover, some will course the landscape flying low across the ground, but um, a, the vast majority do include perch hunting and part of um, their main way of catching their prey. Um, artificial perches, they are much cheaper than barn owl boxes and they have a, less requirements and probably a little bit easier to install. And uh, large trees and barn owl nest boxes make great perches too. So they kind of complement each other. These are photos of a variety of raptor species all at a single vineyard um, on their network of um, perches. And so we have our, some red tails over here, a red tail with prey, um, a pair, a mated pair that um, has this perch in their territory that they're constantly using. American kestrel um, over here, we have some a pair of great horned owls at night. And then we have a golden eagle using a perch here. And then the next slide is just illustrating um, barn owl boxes being really great perches. And it doesn't matter if barn owls are, aren't using the box, it doesn't seem to um, bother them. And um, they don't, I don't think they, because they're so quiet during 
the day time. I don't even think that there's any sort of like interaction that goes on if a raptor is using a barn owl box to perch on. They also will use the barn owl boxes sort of as a plate because we often see this kind of going on and find a lot of um, prey remains and uh, stuff left over on the boxes. And then I, lastly on this slide, I just wanna point out, so these boxes are the same size and with showing kind of the size of three different species. So we have a red tail over here, a kestrel, um, it's just, uh, so small, so it's zoomed in. And then over here we have a golden eagle. So you can see um, how much larger um, golden eagles are than red tails, which are larger than kestrels. And um, okay, so jumping into raptor perch construction, um, there is a variety of ways that these could be made and put together. So I'll recommend um, one way, but just wanna um, note that this golden eagle is not deterred that, uh, by using this perch, even though it's kind of wobbly and um, flimsy. But most birds that are going to be using the perches will not be weighing as much as this bird. So golden eagles can be up to, you know, even 18 pounds, whereas like a red tail's one to two pounds. Um, and uh, we recommend a galvanized steel pole. It can be as small as a three quarter inch diameter. You'll have to have something across the top here that you can bolt a cross beam in. Uh, the cross beam should be wooden so they don't get hot in the sun. And this, these cross beams are made out of um, scrap wood from uh, wine barrels. Um, a study also showed that a double cross beam is not necessary. They don't get used anymore. So a single cross beam should be sufficient. Um, also looking at heights for perches between 10, 15, and 20 feet. 15 feet was optimal and were used uh, more often. Uh, so you can drop these poles into a hole with some concrete or they could be secured to existing fence posts if they are um, secure enough. And um, here's just some examples. So you could see there's a pole in the ground here, and then there's a, a wooden four by four with a smaller piece of wood um, extending that height on that perch. This is an example of attaching um, the perch to a fence post. And uh, in terms of placement, so you're, in terms of cost, because they are a lot cheaper than nest boxes, you could. Um, probably put a lot more perches. There's no minimum or maximum recommendation, but there is some research showing that um, where you locate them might influence how often they're used. And raptors have incredible eyesight and, and they really like to be at this the highest vantage point. And so we uh, it was found that perches on hilltops were used much more frequently frequently than perches that were at the bottom of a hill. Um, same thing with close to trees versus uh, further away. So you wanna put it in an open area and keep them away from trees. Trees are, are already natural perching substrate. And so um, it's not likely that perches will be very effective if um, put around trees. They can be placed directly in crop fields. So in, in vineyards and um, other things, there's a lot of uh, perching substrate in terms of the um, infrastructure for the vines that are used. But even in a vineyard, you know, having a, a taller perch, a raptor would probably select that and hunt from that more often. Um, another interesting thing about placing them in crop fields is if uh, you can bring them into a crop field and then if that's gonna end up getting in the way of machinery, you can take that out before harvest. Um, Different habitats and crop types and different regions, they're gonna see different visitation rates. And this kind of goes back into this previous bullet point that some people have played with the idea of mobile perches. So I think one good example of that is putting it in crops and then removing it if it's gonna be in the way of machinery. Um, but because, like I said, because they aren't very um, as expensive, I think that rather than you know, moving perches from field to field, it might just be beneficial to install more perches if you think that is going to be helpful. And then lastly, they shouldn't be placed along any type of road that gets regular vehicle traffic 
um, so county roads or highways, just because of the uh, risk of collision. So this is a nice example on a vineyard at one of my study sites. They have these rolling hills and um, at the top of each hill, they have a raptor perch. Um, so this is a good example putting at the top of the hill um, and they get used pretty often. This is a image from the Power of Raptors for Pest Control, a Wild Farm Alliance video and uh, Peter Martinelli of Fresh Run Farms. He had a really um, novel idea for perches. He had sparrows in his um, crop here and he added these small PVC uh, tea posts to his sprinklers, which ended up attracting Cooper's hawks. And so Cooper's hawks are bird specialists and they were you know, attracted by that um, bird activity, but they also consume, opportunistically consume small rodents. And so um, this is just a really interesting and novel idea and kind of a different way to use purchase than I had just presented. Um, large trees and edge habitat are, can be important to provide perching and nesting substrate for many raptors. Um, I'm not really gonna get into what that entails, uh, but we do know from research that edge habitat can provide multiple benefits in terms of um, insect and um, other natural pest control, but you should uh, seek regional specific advice on what's appropriate uh, edge habitat for your um, region. And then lastly, before I uh, um, finish uh, these slides, I wanna touch on um, integrated pest management. And so that's using you know, multiple approaches to tackle a pest problem. And so um, while raptors may be one tool in our toolbox, they're never gonna reduce rodent populations to zero. So they um, may, um, decrease, or sorry, they may um, reduce the rate that rodent populations increase or grow. They may limit the maximum density of rodent populations. But like I said, they're never gonna drive that pest problem all the way to zero. And so additional control methods might be needed to keep rodent damage at tolerable levels. And um, one thing we just want you to consider is that how these different control methods might interact with raptors on the landscape because um, many control methods can have non-target effects. And I really specifically wanna focus on um, anticoagulant rodenticides used um, simultaneously with barn owls. And so in a perfect world, what we would see is, you know, this IPM rodent management and we would have increased pest control, but because um, anticoagulant rodenticides and um, barn owls and other raptors can also interact, we may see this, um, we, we may have secondary poisoning. And basically what we don't know is at what rate is this happening on farms? And we also, um, aren't sure if when we when this is happening, maybe it's reducing the pest control that raptors are providing and maybe being a little bit um, counterintuitive. And so there's a lot of active research on this front, um, but for now, um, I'm just gonna report some exposure rates in carcasses of mammalian and raptors um, that have been um, the focus of various studies. Oh, greater, you, uh, it's been shown that greater than 75% of these um, carcasses had residues of anticoagulant rodenticides in their liver, so indicating that they came into contact with these compounds at some point um, during their lives or within the past six months to year. And um, I really want to focus on the um, second generation ARs. These are found more commonly in the tissues of um, of um, animals that are the focus of these types of studies because they have increased toxicity and they persist longer in the tissues of animals. Um, and that's because the first generation compounds, uh, some, some pest resistance started evolving. And so um, stronger and stronger compounds were made over time. And, and with that um, became increased risk. And I know there's different laws and regulations for these compounds in different states. And so it, it would be some, uh, something good to know about what the regulations are in your area, but also have that 
thought in the back of your head of how that's going to be interacting with other things that are going on on the landscape, like rodent pest control from raptors. Um, so overall, I think some of the tools that we've talked about today, incorporating habitat and nest boxes and perches, you know, it's really a win-win for humans and for wildlife. Um, and I hope that you guys take away some um, great new strategies and new information that can be beneficial in your um, personal endeavors. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge all my collaborators and um, colleagues on this project, and I can take any questions. Awesome job, Brianna. So yes, uh, you should be seeing a poll pop up on your screen now that just has a couple of questions related to what you just covered. Um, and of course, we had plenty of questions that came <laughs> through the chat. So uh, first one that I wanted to fill is a question about uh, perches. So if you're installing these perches in ag areas or grasslands, but are close to transmission lines, such as power lines, um, what, um, what recommendations would you make about that? Yeah, transmission lines, they do, they do pose a threat for um, electrocution. They also, the towers themselves also provide really great perching and sometimes even nesting substrate. So it, it kind of depends on the certain setup that is there because on, on the really high, um, I like the, the really large transmission towers and they're with the wires space far, far enough apart, there's some uh, mitigation um, things that are already in place to prevent those types of electrocutions. And so I'm not sure what the specific setup is, um, but I would say that especially you, if power or if, um, yeah, electrical wires were kind of the height or within the direct um, area of, sorry, Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry speaking about that. Of electricity. <laughs> um, yeah, speaking of electricity. Yeah, I would. I mean, you don't want them to collide with those wires. So if they're up really high, um, it shouldn't be in a pro a problem with the perches. But if there's transmission um, towers, you might those might already be natural perching substrates where they can get a really high and really good view. So you might want to focus perches in other areas that don't have natural perching substrate. Wonderful, thank you. So um, just a, another minute or so to fill out the poll questions. Um, now we have a series of questions about the um, pesticide effects, right? So um, we'll get into more of that um, after this, but uh, the first one is just, what if you do come across a, a bird or, or monitoring birds on your farm and they do have, um, potential exposure to residenticides. Is there any opportunity to get those birds tested or kind of what's the monitoring process for that? Yeah, so right now there are a lot of um, studies that are going on regionally. Um, so in California, I know that there that the Department of Fish and Wildlife will test um, animal carcasses that are sent to them. In Washington, I believe there was or is also a study associated with a wildlife rehab, but I don't know the details. Um, I also uh, don't know the details on sending carcasses to the Fish and Wildlife um, Investigations Lab in California, but um, maybe I can provide more information that can be posted um, but yeah, other than that, we there aren't very many opportunities to test these birds. Um, there's a variety of things that could cause mortality. So roads are a huge source um, of mortality. And so uh, just because there is a deceased bird, it might not necessarily be due to pesticides or rodenticides. Um, it would be great if we could just, if we could tell in every single circumstance, but unfortunately we can't. So that's why um, studies looking into the rates that this is going on are um, important to kind of shed light on 
riskier areas or riskier practices. Um, but yeah, so for now, we do know that the second generations are more risky, second generation anticoagulant rodenticides. They, are, they do pose more of a risk. Um, and so, yeah, I don't really have a full answer for that. I don't know if Matt has anything he wants to add. No, I think you covered it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So uh, we wrapped up the poll there. So Brian, if you just wanted to quickly go over what the correct responses would have been for your two questions. Yeah. Okay. So I don't have the most <laughs> updated version of Zoom apparently because okay. I don't see the poll, but I do, I have it. I have my questions right here. So if you could comment on the, on whether or not people were getting it correct, I can talk about the different answers. Um, really? Yeah, I think most people were really on the dot. So okay. they ad acknowledged that the raptor perches on top of hills and ridge lines, as well as um, operating through that landscape of fear concept. So really, actually, uh, they did quite well on that one. Um, there was a little bit more of a spread on the question related to those second generation ARs and, and okay. how they're posing those risks. So um, can you confirm yeah. that it was all of the above? <laughs> yeah, so the answer and um, the answer to, I know I just touched on this at the end, but the answer to the second question was all of the above. So second generation anticoagulant rodenticides are, like I said, they were created in response to um, the, this um, pest resistance to the first generation anticoagulant rodenticides and are more toxic. Um, and because of that, they persist longer in the tissues of predators. They're sequestered in the liver. And so they can really um, build up over time and stay there um, until, uh, yeah. And basically what makes them dangerous is that they're also, a predators are also able to you know, consume a larger dose of this compound because while a rodent um, may only take one feeding to be a lethal dose, the um, rodents will take feedings over several days before actually dying. And so um, they can have like the super lethal dose um, in their meal potentially. So um, all of the above is true. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and hopefully those further details may have covered a couple of additional questions that may have come up about um, you have the, the percentage that were measured in these um, carcasses, but tying that directly to a mortality rate often is, is rather difficult, correct? Yes, yeah, that's um, true because um, they can have lethal effects, which would ultimately be death, but they can also have sublethal effects. And so um, when these birds are getting into dangerous situations and potentially dying from that, we're not sure if they were disoriented because they were under, you know, they were intoxicated through, from these compounds. Um, maybe a regular injury, you know, hunting for prey is, can be really dangerous and, and, and physical. And so they can get injured in the process of that. Um, but if they have a high dose of these um, compounds in their system already, a regular injury could be, end up becoming, you know, a mortal wound because how these um, compounds work is by preventing blood clotting factors. And so if they're not able to um, if they get like a larger wound, it could be more risky having these compounds in their system. And so, yes, there's a lot of active research in this area and there's so many questions that I wish I had the answers to, but unfortunately we just don't know at this time. Right, and again, this is a, consider this today, this lesson is one of not only 10 of our course, but also this is just a touching point on the whole broad areas of research. So please feel free to reach out to any of our speakers today with further questions. And I'll just remind folks that we have been collecting all the questions today. And those that go unanswered, we will get a typed response that we will then post on our resources website. So in saying that, if you can go ahead and stop your share there, I'll pull up my screen. And we'll just uh, try and see how many of these questions we can knock through. So you should be able to see my screen that has the farm discussion session, right? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I wanted to return back a little bit to the boxes and just this idea of imagine 
you're on a farm and you're trying to bring not just raptors, but maybe you wanna have boxes for other birds as well or different raptor species. Um, how do you kind of um, make up for those uh, proximities to other nest box features on your farm? Uh, like proximity between different types of nest boxes? Correct. Yeah, so I think the songbird nest boxes and the barn owl boxes um, can be deployed um, independently. They're not going to interact much with each other. Um, the kestrels, as we mentioned, they're a little bit more secretive. Um, and so it's probably better to have those a little bit further away from barn owl boxes. Um, but the songbird boxes and the owl boxes can, can go right up next to each other. And uh, somebody wanted a clarification for um, when you're attaching the box to a pole, um, how do you man mount it in a way that you could still access it for cleaning? Yeah, good question. Um, the, probably the two most common designs is to have the box mounted right on top of the pole. So maybe a metal or wooden plate that has been um, attached to the pole and then screwed to the box. Um, or the pole goes along um, the back of the box and the box is attached to the pole that way. In either case, you do need to have access to that cleaning hatch, right? So that's a good question. You don't want your pole to obscure the access to that cleaning hatch. Um, and then in terms of getting up there, um, we have seen some designs where people have tried to figure out like being able to raise and lower the next box. Um, those don't seem to work that great. You're just gonna have to get a ladder and climb up there. Um, and to clean the nest box out. But again, if you're in the Napa Sonoma area and you're looking for um, help with that, there are some services for that. Great, thank you. Um, we'll uh, kind of combine this um, idea into one. So those folks that are really across North America, but especially here in the West Coast, right? We've experienced a lot of these uh, climatic events of extreme heat or warming from California all the way up into British Columbia. So can you talk a little bit more about those features on these nest boxes that can improve the kind of function uh, value of these boxes? Yeah, maybe we can both chime in on that a little bit. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a real concern. <clears throat> uh, you know, barn owls will occupy some pretty hot, arid places um, here in the West Coast, as well as in Israel. So Israeli, Biologists and farmers have been using nest boxes for a long time for barn owls. Um, it gets dangerously hot there as well. So there are a few things you can do. Um, the heat panels we think are really helpful. So putting those heat shields on the box, um, orienting away from the hot afternoon sun, um, uh, as well as the vent holes. Um, and then I think somebody else made a comment um, about paint. You could paint the box a light color. Um, that would also be good for reflecting heat. Um, just make sure it's um, it's fully dry and you don't paint the inside and ideally you use a low VOC paint. Wonderful. Brand, did you have anything to add on to that or did Matt kind of cover it? I think those are all really great points and I don't have uh, anything else to add to that. Great. So um, as we're looking at the clock here, we are getting close to wrapping things up today. Um, so uh, before you go, we do have uh, the fourth and final uh, post-lesson quiz uh, to fill out. And um, while you're working on that, you'll see some of those questions may be similar to what you saw at the start of today's lesson. Um, and while folks are filling that out, um, I, I did want to ask this one question before I, uh, each of you give us a little wrap up. And this question was just related to what if farmers are actually in places where their crops are trees and they're not open areas? Um, how should you place those boxes to make the most benefit from them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, some of the mature walnut orchards in California, I think, fall under that category. Um, I think in those cases, you know, there are still rodents active in those orchards and along the edges. So I think having the barn owl boxes um, along the edges um, can still be useful. Um, I also worked um, last summer, was it last summer, um, in some pistachio and fig orchards. Um, and those um, are also wooded, but not as uh, a dense a canopy. And they had those boxes on tall poles that basically protruded up above the canopy of the pistachio. Um, trees, and so that could work as well. That might be relevant for cherries, for example. 
Great, thank you. And did you have any thoughts, Brianna? Yeah, I have seen uh, barn owl boxes be really successful on the edges of these mature um, tree crop systems. But I do, I really like the idea of um, having, making sure they kind of stick out or are, you know, visible because we do, I have seen some orchards have barn owl boxes um, along inside on the interiors and I have seen roosting. I haven't seen any evidence of nesting, not that it hasn't happened, but I think that they're just going to be more difficult to find. So anything um, to kind of have them be a, out and a little bit more in the open is going to help them to be found and used. Wonderful, thank you. And were there any kind of end uh, lessons that you wanted to pass on before folks head out today? Just enjoy those raptors. It's springtime, the, the, the migratory raptors are coming back. The birds that have been here all year are, are probably laying eggs or have chicks now. It's a wonderful time to be appreciating raptors in the sky and in your fields. I will second that. And I also just want to thank everybody for joining and for their interest in this amazing, uh, you know, natural pest control. And um, I hope that you can take away some information that will be beneficial on your properties. Wonderful. Thank you. So a reminder that this was lesson four of a 10 lesson class. So our next lesson will be about managing pest birds. So I know there were some questions today related to maybe um, how do we um, attract raptors for not just their consumption of rodents, but maybe their ability to help with pests. So please join us um, in May uh, so that we can learn about this, specifically this raptor, the American kestrel, and how they're really nice a tool for actually getting rid of those other birds that may be trying to consume your crops. So thank you so much for participating today. Reminder, we do have that resources page available on our website. We'll have a recording for today's lesson as well as prior lessons there, as well as um, getting those answers to questions that we didn't quite get to today. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to our speakers and we hope you keep it wild on your farms.